and here and, we are, and we're back. Twenty nine, huh? Let's let's do it. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's see it. You're up. Hezekiah was twenty five years old when he became the king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem twenty nine years. His mother Abijah, Ab- 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 Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor, King David, had done. Hey, there we go. Yeah, Hezekiah. Uh, He reopens the temple. Verse 3, in the first month, uh, in the very first month of of the reign, of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He summoned the priests and Levites to meet him at the courtyard east of the temple. He said to them, listen to me, you Levites, purify yourselves and purify the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all the defiled things from the sanctuary. Our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, our God. Mm -hmm. They abandoned the Lord in his dwelling place. They turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the temple's entry room, and they snuffed out the lamps. They stopped burning incense and presenting burnt offerings at the sanctuary of the God of Israel. You know, I love I love Moses and the Levites, their their story because God chose Moses, but the free will of Levites chose God, and it's a perfect image. Yeah. Of God's plan versus God's uh, for our free will that was gifted to us by God merged together, merged together as as the really that great conversation on the bottom of Mount Sinai happened between Moses and the Levites. You know that's interesting. You, from great problems, a lot of times, you know, good people rise to the top. You know, mm-hmm. and guess what? The stock of the Levite clan. Uh, Levite himself and his, his sons came came to the top and said, "We will take the Lord's side and do whatever is necessary to serve God, no matter what that is." Sometimes you got to get a little bloody, you got to get your hands dirty, you know. Of course, we don't kill people now, but sometimes you got to do things that are hard. Make those conversations happen. Walk into the wrong area of town and grab hold of your kids, grab hold of your friends. Whatever it takes, get your feet dirty and walk the path with your friend. You know, sometimes you got to do it. And we choose. That's why we're doing this. We choose, like the Levites, to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Sorry, I went on a rant. Love it. Amen. <laughs> I'm on fire. Bro. Yeah. What's up? Hey, th- you know what? Look, I never respected the Levites as much as you did early on. Like, they were great. They are the priests, and I love that. But as I've gotten into it, and as you have, have, have pointed it out time and time again, it's an honorable thing mm. to choose to serve God. Wow. And you bring that up for today, and it really makes me realize it is such a big deal. They chose to serve him no matter what. Wow. That's great to hear, Brian. That's amazing. Mm, yeah. Mm. Yeah, God is good. Yeah, amen. Okay, eight, right? That's uh, that is why the Lord's anger had fallen, has fallen upon Judah and Jerusalem, north and south. He has made them an object of dread, horror, and ridicule, as you can see with your own eyes. Because of this, our fathers have been killed in battle, and our sons and daughters and wives have been captured. Ten, but now I will make a covenant with the Lord. Man, what a good king. Sorry, John. I'm just, the more we read, the fire, more fired up on the inside I'm getting. Look, Come on. I will make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not neglect your duties any longer. The Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to lead the people in worship and present offerings to him. Then these Levites got right to work from the cl- from the clan of Kohath, Mehath, son of Amasai, Joel, and Joel, son of Azariah, Azariah, and from the clan of Mariah, Kish, son of Abdi, and Azariah, son of Jehalilel, and from the clan of Gershon, Joha, son of Zemra, and Eden, son of Joha, from the clan from the family of Eliezer, Shimri, and 
Jael or Jael. Sorry, mm-hmm. Jael. There it is again. Uh huh. And from the family of Asif, Asif, Zechariah, and Matania, Matananiah. Mm-hmm. And from the from the family of him man he man, Jehiel and Shemai, uh, Shemai, yeah Shemai, from the family of Jeduthin Jeduthin, uh, Shemaya and uh, Uziel, yeah. uh, not King Uziel but the other guy. Uh, Fifteen. These men call uh, called together their fellow Levites. And they all and they all purified themselves. Then they began to cleanse the temple of the Lord, just as the king had commanded. Now, just so if you're listening and you're like, what? they purified themselves. Remember, the Levites had certain regimen they had to do: washings and uh, repenting of sin, and so on, to make themselves pure before the Lord. Amen. Um, they were careful to follow all the Lord's instructions in their work. The priests went into the sanctuary of the temple of the Lord to cleanse it, and they took out of the temple a courtyard all the defiled things they found. From there, the Levites carted it all out to the Kidron Valley. They began to work in early spring, and on the first day of the new year, and in, and in eight days, they, they had reached the entry room of the Lord's temple. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. Then they purified the temple of the Lord itself, which took another eight days. So the entire task was completed in 16 days. Wow. Hard work. Put the Hard work. work. Hey, but they did what the Lord had asked them to. So praise God for that. Yeah, um, absolutely. 18. Yeah, we wait, go ahead. We got to put that work in to, to read God's word. Yeah. And we, we, and we go to work and then we help someone on the way to work. You know, someone ran out of gas, we help them. You know, we get to work where the light, where the, with a light tower to somebody at work, then we get off work, we go to the gym, we train hard for the Lord. Come on. We help them out with some coaching. You know, we get home and, you know, we're making dinner, we're with our family, and we're going over to the neighbor's house to help them, you know, snow plow the driveway. I mean, this is this is putting on your your battle gear, baby. You got to go to work every single day, just like the Levites. It's in a different way, even as as Christians. We got to work, baby. That's right. This ain't no just on the couch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's go. Then the Levite, 18, then the Levites went to King Hezekiah and, re- and gave him the re- this report. We have cleansed the entire temple of the Lord, the altar of burnt offerings with all of its utensils and the table of bread of the presence with all its utensils. We have also recovered all the items discarded by King Ahaz. Ahaz. Ugh. I don't even like to say his name. When he was unfaithful and closed the temple. Now They are now in the front. Of the Lord's, they were in front of the Lord's altar, the in front, front of the altar of the Lord, purified and ready for use. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah gathered the city officials and went to the temple of the Lord. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, and seven male lambs as a burnt offering, together with seven male goats as a sin offering for the kingdom and for the temple and for Judah. The king commanded the priests, who were descendants of Aaron, to sacrifice the animals on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bulls, and the priest took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. The next uh, next they killed next <laughs> they killed the rams and sprinkled the, their blood on the altar. And finally, they did the same with the male lambs. The male goats for the sin offering were then brought before the king and the assembly of people who laid their hands on them. The priest then killed the goats as a sin offering and sprinkled their blood on the altar to make an atonement or a covering for the sins of all Israel. The king had specifically commanded that this burnt offering and sin offering should be made for all Israel. Man, they bring them back, baby. Bring them back to righteousness. Mm-hmm. 25, King Hezekiah then stationed the Levites at the temple of the Lord with cymbals, lyres, and harps. He uh, Remember, this brings me back to King David. Um, yeah. He, ob- he loved music, you know. Tupac, let's go. He yeah. obeyed all the commands that the Lord... I don't really like Tupac, but... He obeyed all the commands of the Lord uh, that the Lord had given to King David through Gad, mm-hmm. the king's seer, and the prophet Nathan. The Levites then took their positions around the temple with the instruments of David, and the priests took their positions with the trumpets. Oh, John, notice it's the priest. It's the priests who play the instruments. Glory to God. 
It just hit me. 27, then Hezekiah ordered that the burnt offering be placed on the altar. As the burnt offering was presented, songs of praise to the Lord were begun, accompanied by the trumpets and the other instruments of David, the former king of Israel. The entire assembly worshipped the Lord as the singers sang and the trumpets blew until all the burnt offerings were finished. Then the king and everyone with him bowed down and worshipped. King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the psalms written by David and by Asaph the seer. So they offered joyous praise and bowed down before the Lord. I'm I'm feeling it. Yeah, they are. And they're taking, they're taking the, um, you. you know, they're inspired by this from, you know, my tattoo here, Second Samuel six fourteen. Right. When King David became the king, and they were playing music, and he was dancing for the Lord with all his might, and they were dancing and singing and loving for God, and you know, they're doing the same thing here. You know, they're living for God, they're worshiping God, they're celebrating God. You know, something that we need to do every single day. Yes. Of our- Every day. Yeah, you know, Paul writes in another place, uh, he's in Psalms, uh, he's, uh, excuse me, in Philip, the Philip, letter to the Philippians, he says, he goes, and he, what you do is you enter, and, and you, uh, you encourage each other with songs and with hymns and spiritual songs. Like, it's a good thing to praise the Lord with all your might. You know, it's a good thing. Yeah. And with 31, then Hezekiah declared that you have, now that you have consecrated yourself to the Lord or separated yourself to the Lord, essentially, bring your sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings to the temple of the Lord. So the people brought their sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings, and all whose heart were willing brought burnt offerings too. Wow, those hearts who were willing. 32, the people brought to the Lord 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 male lambs for burnt offerings. They also brought 600 cattle and 300 sheep and goats as sacrificed offerings. But they were too few priests to prepare all the burnt offerings. So so their relatives, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished and more priests had been purified. For the Levites had been more conscientious about purifying themselves than the priests had been. There was an abundance of burnt offerings along with the unusual, the usual liquid offerings, wine, and a great deal of fat from the many peace offerings. Mm -hmm. So the temple of the Lord was restored to service Mm -hmm. and Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because of what God had done for the people for everything had been accomplished so quickly. Chapter 30. Amen. Chapter I love 30. it. King Hezekiah now sent word to all Israel and Judah, and he wrote letters of invitations invitations of the people of Ephraim and Manasseh. He asked everyone to come to the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel, the king, his officials, and all the community of Jerusalem decided to celebrate Passover a month later than usual— they were unable to celebrate it at the prescribed time because um, because not enough priests could be purified by then, and the people had not yet assembled at Jerusalem. Yeah, the reason why is, remember, they'd bring so many bulls and things to get killed uh, and sacrificed that they're, they're, they wouldn't have time. That's a good point. You're right. This plan mm-hmm. for keeping the Passover seemed right to the king and all the people. So they sent a pro- proclamation, a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba in the south of Dan in the north, inviting everyone to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. The people had not been celebrating it in great numbers as required in the law. So, you know, they were getting a little lukewarm. They need to step their game up. Hey, guys. You know, let's look in the mirror here. Yep. We're not doing enough. Let's go. I love this here. Verse six. I think we can all relate to this. At the king's command, runners were sent through Israel and Judah. They carried letters that said, oh, that's cool. Just think about those runners. <laughs> like barefoot or how are they running? Oh, yeah. Just there to run barefoot, baby. <laughs> oh, people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. So, that he will return 
to the few of us who have survived the conquest, conquest of the Assyrian kings. Do not be like your ancestors and relatives who abandoned the Lord, the God of the, their ancestors, and become an object of derision. Derision. As you yourselves derision. can see, do not be stubborn as they were, but submit yourself to the Lord. Come to his temple, which he has set apart as holy forever. Worship the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. Verse 9, for if you return to the Lord, your relatives and your children will be treated mercifully by their captures, and they will be able to return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. If you return to him, he will not continue to turn his face from you. Notice, notice that, John. No matter what position in life you're in, even if you're captured or you're in bondage, or whatever, if you turn to God right where you are, right in your heart, you pronounce him as Lord over your life. He is your God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, Jesus, right? What does it say? He will, re he will be gracious and merciful, and he will return you to your land. I love it. He, he doesn't think, he doesn't look at a slave or a prison person, a person in prison and say, oh, you're not good enough. Mm. He says, you who are in prison, Turn to me, and I will deliver you to freedom. What a gracious person. That's amazing. Look at here. If you return to him, he will not continue to turn his face from you. Mm. Now, so when you're not walking with God, and you're you know, being worldly, and you've turned your back to God, he will then turn his face from you. Hey. Look at that. Mm. I mean, if you're going through a lot of bad times in life, like, and you just think like, man, this seems like to be just a consistent thing throughout my entire life. Well, your free will, your actions could possibly have God's face turned away from you. Come on, speak and it. Think about, <laughs> think about how much better your life will be today if God's face was toward you. But, I mean, it's That's undeniable. It. it says it. You said it. We all say it. Don't turn your back on the Most High God. I mean, John, he's the, he's the biggest one in the valley. Nothing can stop him. Why would you want to f uh, turn away from him? Anyway. All right, verse 10. Here we go. Here we go. You want to take it? Oh, you can take it. The runners went from town to town throughout Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as the territory of Zebulun. But most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. However, some people from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem. Now, remember, right now we have the king and everyone in Jerusalem are turning back to God, and he's calling everyone in the land, come back, come back. And verse 12, at the same time, God's hand was on the people in the land of Judah, giving them all one heart to obey the orders of the king and his officials who were following the word of the Lord. So a huge crowd assembled at Jerusalem in mid-spring to celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. That would be Passover. So then, so, uh, 14, they set to work and removed the pagan altars from Jerusalem. They took away all the incense altars and threw them into the Kidron Valley. On the 14th day of the second month, one month later than usual, the people slaughtered the Passover lamb. This shamed the priests and Levites, so they purified themselves and brought burnt offerings to the Lord of the to the temple of the Lord. Then they took their places at the temple as prescribed in the law of Moses, the man of God. Yeah, the law of Moses, the man of God. The Levites brought the sacrificial blood to the priests, who then sprinkled it on the altar. Since many of the people had not purified themselves, the Levites had slaughtered had to slaughter their Passover lamb for them to set them apart for the Lord. Now, what he's talking about is the priests hadn't, hadn't purified themselves, but the Levites, and even though they're priests also, they're the relatives of the priests, they, earlier it says they, sacri they, they cleansed themselves more detailed or they, they, they cared more about it. So they were all, uh, they were all cleansed. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Uh, 18, most of those who came from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun 
had not purified themselves, but King Hezekiah prayed for them, and they were allowed to eat the Passover meal anyway, even though this was contrary to the requirements of the law. For Hezekiah said, May the Lord, who is good, pardon those who who decide to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even though they are not properly cleansed for the ceremony. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah's prayer and healed the people. How merciful is God. Yeah. Look, you know, look at that. He's he loves you, John. He loves me. He wants us to be there. You know, he's like, come on in. Let's pray for you. Let's get this right. That's okay. You messed up. Anyway. Yeah, amen. And if you think that God's not listening to your prayer, look at you know, prayers. Look at verse 20. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah's prayer and healed the people. Amen. Now, God's not gonna answer all your prayers. There's probably a reason for that. You know, some will be answered, and that's God's will. And so there you go. It's it's factual. It's proof. come on now, right here, verse twenty. You know, that's a that's a ta- that's an arm tattoo right there. I mean, look yeah. at that. Lord, listen to Hezekiah's prayers and healed the people. That's a good. That is an arm tattoo. That's a That's it. Look. So if you if you're serving the Lord and your heart's right toward God, look, He'll give you what to pray. Like I'm sure that He put that in Hezekiah's heart. Pray for the people. That way they can participate. Listen, they're coming back. This is brand new again. You think God's not merciful? You think, what, he's a God of wrath? If he was a really a God of just wrath, he would have burned those people down. But guess what? I don't see wrath. I see love. I see, come on back, son. Come on back, daughter. I love you. Where, where's the part where they find the Bible that I was talking about? It's today? coming up. It's coming up. Uh, It's coming up, so... So the people of Israel, 21, the people of Israel who were present in Jerusalem joyously celebrated the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. Each day, the Levites and the priests sang to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. Hezekiah encouraged all the Levites regarding the skill they had dis- they displayed as they served the Lord. The celebration continued for seven days. Peace offerings were sacrificed, and the people gave thanks to the Lord the God of their ancestors. The entire assembly then decided to continue the festival another seven days. So they celebrated joyfully for another week. King Hezekiah gave the people 1,000 bulls, 700 sheep, and goats for offerings. Thousand. Yeah, 1,000 bulls, 7,000, my bad. 7,000 sheep and 7,000 goats. Wow. 15,000 animals. Uh, and the officials donated 1,000 bulls and 10,000 sheep and goats. Meanwhile, many more priests purified themselves. The mm. entire assembly of Judah rejoiced the south right here, including the priests, the Levites, and all who came from the land of Israel. The foreigners who came to the fest- Ooh, listen to this. the foreigners who came to the festival and all those who lived in Judah. Notice that the foreigners participated. I love it. Yeah. You know, and it said that um, way back, right, Brian? Like Deuteronomy, um, maybe, um, yeah, maybe Deuteronomy, you know, uh, it, it talked about the how the foreigners are 100% allowed to celebrate with yeah. all these uh, festivals. Um, they had a, there's some guidelines. But the Lord was like, open arms. Come on in. He makes it really clear. And, you know, on the recap here, he's making it clear again. You know, it's just such an image of Jesus and, you know, God loves everybody. And mm. we all we all come from Adam and Eve. And, you know, it's just perfect. Look, it's, it's, the Bible says in Psalms, anyone who seeks the Lord shall be happy and rejoice in him. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, this shows you right there. God includes all of us. Uh, King James actually calls them strangers. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, it's even, it's, yeah, it's even deeper. Uh, 26, there was a great joy in the city, for Jerusalem had not seen a celebration like this once since, this, uh, not a celebration like this since the days of Solomon, da- King David's son. Mm. Then the priests and Levites stood and blessed the people, and God heard their prayer from his holy dwelling in heaven. Amen. Oh, that's cool. Amen to that. Yeah, um, if you, if you, it's over and over again. If you love and, and seek him, he says, you will not be lost, but you will be found. You will find in me. You know? Mm. 31, you want to kick her off? 
<clears throat> do you mind if we do a two minute music break? I need to go get some water. My throat's getting kind of. Let's do it. Two minutes. Yeah, let me just pull up this uh, instrumental song. It again. seems like these are short chapters, so we're going to get it done. Yeah. All right. Just give me like two minutes. We'll be right back for the next chapter. All right. Thank you. Yeah, so we're just taking. All right, we're just taking a break. God is good, though. My goodness. Hezekiah, you know, the real answer is not just, uh, you know, read the Bible and have to pray and you have to do things. Literally, God is calling all of us to just love him. Because when you love him, he shows himself to you and to me. It, tru it truly is a remarkable thing to when you f wholeheartedly like get to know God, when you wholeheartedly read and study who he is, especially in the New Testament. Now, I know you could find him in the old, but when you begin to open in the, in the New Testament, like where he is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he begins to show himself throughout the whole uh, text he shows up and you meet him and then one day you're like lord and he says yeah what's up i know i knew you were gonna call i love you but what's up he wants to hear from us and you know those people who naysayers who are like oh well god knows everything why doesn't he just do it he wants to hear from us lord like right i know you want to hear from us and so that's the answer Talk to him like he's your father, like he's your friend, like he's God, the one who loves and cares for you about everything. It's amazing. All right, John's back. Truly amazing. All right, I'm back. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, here we go. Hezekiah. All right. We are Second Chronicles 31. Do uh, you want me to start it off? Let's do it. All right. When the festival ended, the Israelites who attended went to all the towns of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, and they smashed all the sacred pillars. I love that. Amen. It's wine. Feeling pretty good. Let's go tear them I down. I know, right? Come on, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Grab your soul. This is like two, remember, it's two weeks of like, you know, celebrating Passover. Yeah, they were they were extra confident. I like it. Well, think about this, too. Like you said, Brian, two weeks of celebrating God, a festival of the Lord, right, of the Passover, and you're you're boiling hot for God. And so they go down and they tear all these Asherah poles down and, and bail and all this stuff, right? Man, that's how we should be every day. Mm. But you know what? Time will pass. The, luke, the, the hot boiling water will then sizzle down to lukewarm which is never good. And then who knows, maybe even the water gets a little cold, right? And so I think we need to read this and be like, you know what? Let's celebrate every day like it's the festival of the Lord. Amen. Like every day we should just wake up and be like, hey, today's the festival of the Lord. Like Jesus has risen. Yahweh That's... is God. It's true. Think about it. We wake up every Christmas. It's Christmas. Oh, come on, call. Let's open the gifts and you know, happy, happy birthday, Jesus. And but we have this this day, right, of celebration for God's birthday. Mm -hmm. Why can't every day be Christmas? It is Christmas. He rose, and he's available to anyone. I love it. That's a great way to think about it. Every day should be like Christmas because Jesus is still on the throne, giving life to anyone. Who calls out to him? Come on now. And so what we we present the gift, John. Every day we present a gift to the world. The gift of Jesus. The gift of eternal life. And the eternal king, Jesus. Yeah. Every day. 
We can give a gift. He gives it freely, it says. Now, why do you think the tabernacle is nowhere to be found right now? Because the tabernacle is inside of you. You are. We are the tabernacle. Come on. Come on now. That's right. Tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. Uh, let's see here. Da, da, da. Uh, smash the sacred. Cut down the astral poles and remove the pagan shrines and altars. After this, the Israelites return to their own towns and homes. Uh, verse 2, Hezekiah then organized the priests and Levites into divisions to offer the burnt offerings and peace offerings and to worship and give thanks and praise to the Lord at the gates of the temple. The king also made a personal contribu contribution contribution of animals for the daily morning and evening burnt offerings, the weekly Sabbath festivals, the monthly new moon festivals, and the annual festivals as prescribed in the law of the Lord. And, and just like we talked about, Brian, that is why these are here. It is to keep the water boiling hot for Yahweh. That's it. Like God knows that we need this structure. I mean, I think there's obviously layers to why these festivals are happening, of course, but I think that's one reason. God's Absolutely. Like, you know, um, these people need to like stay on track and having these festivals, like in weightlifting, right? Book a lot of weightlifting meets, have a lot of weightlifting meets on the calendar. That's going to help your training. Same thing with, with this right here, man, that you nailed it. I think that's a big one. Keep the water boiling, you know? Yeah. That's why it's like, that's why the temple is in the middle. The, the, the tabernacle is in the middle. So everybody can see it. Amen. Verse four. In addition, he required the people of Jerusalem to bring a portion of their goods to the priests and Levites so they could devote themselves um, fully to the law of the Lord. Verse 5, when the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously by bringing their first share of their grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and all the product, uh, produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity and tithe of all they produced. Um, they, uh, uh, Brett Metter always talks about how he, he only does tithing, um, services when it comes up in the Bible. So he's actually only done a few cause the tithing doesn't come up a lot. Like some churches like to kind of nudge at, mm -hmm. you know, it's really only comes up as he said a few times. And this is one of them. So I'm sure this morning, uh, or Wednesday night with Brett, he, he did a tithing service. Probably so. Look at that, your first grains, your first everything. Bring it to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in the New Testament, it's, it's a requirement in the old law, in the old covenant, right? It's a requirement. We don't have that requirement necessarily, but we still should tithe. You still should give 10, 12, 15, 18, 20%. Whatever the God puts on your heart, you know, uh, absolutely. Give your time, money, whatever. There's a donate button on our website, so. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I, hey I, I give. I know, honestly. I mean, if anybody does love this um, Bible study that we're doing, cover to cover, you you can donate uh, on the on the website. There. Absolutely, do, do it. Button yeah. right there. So yeah, not saying that's a tithe, but you know, in a in a way, I guess it is. But yeah, it's like you know, you, you don't have to like help the person that's on the side of the road out of gas, but you should. You should exactly if you want to. You know, it's like us as Christians. Like too many Christians out there are just, oh, I have Jesus. I'm good. Right. You know, like, yeah, that's the, that is the gift of the Lord is that you have Jesus. So that is that you are good, but why stop there? Out of your heart. Now you give freely what's been given to you, you know? So now he blesses you with money. Give money. He blesses you with time. Give time, give joy, go bake some cookies and give them to your name. Everyone should this week bake some cookies or put up a, a fruit tray and go give it to a neighbor and be like, you know, I was just thinking about you. How you doing? Mr. And Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Smith or whatever. And love your neighbor, you know, actually go knock on the door today to tomorrow and say, you know, do you have anything that you need help with? Like you have light bulbs you want me to change an air uh, cleaner. You want me to change? You want me to vacuum for you? You know, are you having a problem uh, getting yeah. to things? I'm here for you. Come on now. Yeah. They brought a large quantity uh, and tithe all of their uh, pr produce, all that they produce, produced. Verse 6, the people who had moved to Judah from Israel and the people of Judah themselves brought in the tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats, and a tithe of the things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in, a, in great heaps. They began piling them up in late spring, 
and the heaps continued to grow until early autumn. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw these huge piles, they thanked the Lord and his people Israel. Verse 9, quote, Where did all this come from? Hezekiah asked the priest and Levites. And Azariah, the high priest from the family of Zodak, Zodok, replied, Since the people begin uh, since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. The Lord had blessed his people, and all this is left over. It kind of mm. reminds me of Jesus when he uh, made all those meals from like one fish. Yeah, fish and loaves. And they had 12 baskets full afterwards. So one little basket a couple fish and a few loaves of bread, and boom, he feeds 5,000 plus women and children, and they have 12 baskets full left over. Come on now. Amazing. Uh, you want to take 11? Sure. Hezekiah ordered the storerooms to be prepared in the temple of the Lord. When this was done, the people faithfully brought all the gifts, tithes, and other items dedicated for use in the temple. Kohananiah, uh, Kohananiah, Kohananiah, Conan, I want to say that, Conaniah, the Levite, was put in charge, assisted by his brother Shemi, Shemai. The supervisors under them were uh, Jehiel, Ezariah, Ezaziah, Nahath, Asahiel, Jeremoth, Johabad, uh, Eliel, Ismachiah, Mahath, and Benaniah. These these appointed appointments were made by King Hezekiah and Azariah, the chief official in the temple of God. Kor, son of Emna, the Levite, who was the gatekeeper at the east gate, east gate, John. That's where Jesus is returning to. Um, yeah, was put, yeah, the east gate. He was put in. Go ahead. The the gate that nobody can destroy. Yeah, no little, kidding. Little gate, you know. Yeah, and I remember did a whole service on this gate, and he went. He did an hour and a half, maybe even two hour Wednesday night service of all of the military attempts throughout the last like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of trying to destroy this gate. And it <laughs> never has been destroyed. Oops. You wonder why? Because it's biblical that it won't be destroyed. That's right. And it's biblical that Jesus is going to come smash through it on the white horse with us behind him. <laughs> it's a fact. The reason why that little gate has not been destroyed is because it's God willing. It's in the Bible. That's why the Bible is perfect in all aspects. I mean, we're talking story after story after story after story of military attacks. And people say, we're going to take that gate out and prove that God is not real and prove that God can be messed with. We're going to take that gate out because we hate the Jews and all these horrible things that other people would say to take that gate out. And they haven't been able to. Let's go. Just like no one's been able to take over Israel, and it's a little, t it's the size of New uh, New Jersey. <laughs> Why do you think that is, baby? Because God, Yahweh, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, give me my sword. That's it, man. Come on, the King of Kings. He, you can't stop him. You think you can? Some, you think flesh and blood and some demonic spirit can stop the God of heaven and earth, who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth? Think about that. Oh, the guy who made me and and created the heavens and the earth, I can I can thwart, I can put down, I can beat. Mm. Give me a break. He's got billions of loopholes to get around any attack that you make, any curse that you think you can put on someone. God has the answer a billion times over. Mm -hmm. So anyway. So he was put in charge of distrib distributing the voluntary offerings given to God, the gifts and the things that had been dedicated to the Lord. His fa 15, his faithful as assistants were Eden, uh, Menem, Menayim, uh Yeshua, nice, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shekaniah. Shekaniah. They distrib uh, distributed the gifts among the families of priests in their towns by their divisions. Dividing the gifts fairly among old and young alike. Remember, all the tithe was given to the priesthood so they didn't have to work and they dedicate their service to the Lord. Remember, when lots and lots of gifts came in, they sacrificed day and night and all the time. And they have no land. Yeah. Remember? Remember? Yeah. Caleb yeah. got his land. You know, Joshua at the very end yeah. got his land. Everyone got their land. You know, Caleb gave his daughter a bunch of land. She wanted more land, so he gave her more land. Everyone got their land. Everyone is peaceful. 
you know, when they crossed the Jordan and fought the battles, but the Levites had no land because the world is their land. That's it. The world. God, they inherit God. <laughs> oh, shoot. That's like when King David was like, I'm building a tent over the temple so God can sleep in the tent. God I know. Said, I don't need a tent, King David. I love you. Thank yeah. you for thinking of me, but I don't need a tent, baby. That's why the Levites need no land. That's right. Serving the Lord constantly. Um, they distributed gifts to the priests who were listed by families in the genealogical records and to the Levites 20 years old or older who were listed according to their jobs and their divisions. Food allotments were also given to the families and all those listed in the genealogical records, including their little babies, wives, sons, and daughters, for they had all been faithful in purifying themselves as for the priests hey, look at that we're, we're, we're real quick look at that look at that look at that food also given the families who listed in the general records including their little babies babies and look at it says for they had all been faithful and purifying themselves faithful babies faithful look at that yep babies they're they're faithful because they're babies and, and, and there you go. There's another line out of many other lines in the Bible that say that when you're a baby, when you're a young, young, you know, child, if something bad happens to you, you go to heaven. Look at this. Babies are faithful. Babies, it's not like the baby woke up, you know, from the nap and said, I'm going to do, I'm going to purify myself and be faithful to God. Yeah, I don't think they did that either. You can't do that. They're babies. But it says right here, babies, faithful and purifying themselves. So no matter what, babies are faithful. They're always purified. They are always purified. They have no free will in this of turning their back to God. But look at that. Look at that. It's interesting. You don't see the word babies a lot in the Bible. Can we go to the Hebrew on this? Little ones. It says little ones? Mm-hmm. Even better. That even oh. makes more from that like age seven down on the accountability scale that we talk about. Man, I just love the I love God's word. I can flip this table. Yeah, it's we don't know exactly the age, but it's the little ones, those who are I mean, it could be 15. Some people are real innocent. And it's that moment, you know, it's the from zero to whenever mm -hmm. when you say, "Oh, I got to choose between God and the world." Mm -hmm. You know, and all our kids are choosing God. Amen. They choose God because they're babies. They That's what I'm saying. They don't have to choose. They're automatically purified. They're automatically faithful. They automatically go to heaven. 18. Well, can we can we mark this down? Uh 2 Chronicles 31, 18. Yeah, they're uh uh they're little ones. Amazing. Children, little children, little ones. That's what the strong's Hebrew definition is. And look at this too. They're separating the little ones, you know, babies here in the new living, with the sons and daughters too. Yeah. Not lumping them together. Right. So this is the really, really small ones. There's divisions in ages, right? And and almost in like uh, you know, mindsets. You know, you have your wives, you have your sons and daughters, and then you have little little ones, little babies, people, you know. And I think they also purified, you know, they, they did service to, to to actually do this. But absolutely, these little babies, God cares about babies. Hello. That's why abortion is wrong. I'll say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Send me a letter. I don't care. 19. Yeah. <laughs> As for the priests or our social media, I say whatever you want. But do, let me ask you a question. Do you think, do you think by the Catholics might take this 18 here and say that's why they baptize their babies because this is not baptism no this isn't bad this is purification this is offering sacrifices and doing bab uh doing baths and putting on clean clothes and stuff that's not defiled like by touching dead things or blood or or you know cem cemetery i don't think that's that might be one of them. Yeah. So you can't be around dead things. There's certain criteria to purify yourself, bathings and so on. Not baptism at all. Baptism is a symbol of, of a bath, right? Going down and coming up as a new creation in Christ Jesus or as forgiveness of sins as a new uh, believer. So 
Yeah, but the whole baptism thing about the babies is fear. Look at that. They baptize their babies out of fear. Well, you know, and that's fine, but you have them once free will, you know, once they're older, they should re-baptize. Absolutely. Look at that, though. I, I'm kind of rereading this here. I'm reading it again, and this is shocking. I'm actually going to sit. I'm going to stay on this for one more second because. Go ahead. Look at that. Food allotments were also given to the families and of all those listed in the gene gen genealogical records, including their little babies, wives, sons, and daughters, for they had all been faithful in purifying themselves. Amazing. Purifying. Look at this. For they all had been faithful babies. Faithful. A baby is too young. Little ones are too young to understand even what we're reading here. They don't understand faith. They don't understand God. They're not turning away from God, but they're not even turning to, to, turning to God. But the God makes it clear here that the babies are faithful, meaning that little ones, babies, are faithful to the Lord. Therefore, they go to heaven no matter what. Proof. Uh yeah, let's go. Let's see, what does it say? The Hebrew says, all to whom were written in the geneal geneal genealogy, their little ones, their whole, the whole, and daughters, their wives, their sons, for the company of them, they in their faithfulness, they sanctified themselves. Oh, even better. Yeah. Uh, that's a tad. I'm arm and tad in this. <laughs> 100% in the Lord's name. 3118. Like yeah, 3118. I'm I'm tatting this. And for anybody that's lost a child, I'm just going to say, "Hey, let me this is what this means." Yeah. Yeah, God cares. God cares. You know, you do you know um did you, do you know that uh, of a Christian man who went to heaven without being baptized in water? Uh, I'm sure there's many, but I know one for sure. The man ooh. on the cross. The thief. You're right. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So even though it's uh, Jesus, you know, it said, you know, be, get baptized in water as Jesus did. The requirement is faith in Jesus. Look you at know? that. Yeah, it's a, he's amazing. Careful. See, I think some people might read this too quickly. They might just go right over 18 and go right into 19. Yeah, they probably do. Look they probably baby. do. Look at that, babies. I actually kind of like the new living when it says babies, but little ones is good too. Yeah, little babies, it's, it's right on the money. Yeah. All right, you ready? Sorry, yeah, I, I apologize to everybody. I Don't be, read. you're good. All right, we have a, go ahead, a slam dunk it. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Did you write that out on my tattoo notes? I can, though. Sorry. Let's do it. All right, 19. As the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who were living in the open villages around the towns, men were appointed by name to distribute portions to every male among their priests and to all the Levites list, listed in the genealogical records. Verse 20, in this way, King Hezekiah handled the distribution through all Judah, uh, throughout all Judah, doing what was pleasing uh, and good in the sight of the Lord his God. And all that he did in the service of the temple of God and in his efforts to follow God's law and commands, Hezekiah sought God, his God, wholeheartedly. Mm. As a result, he was very successful. See, isn't that interesting? It's like you go to Barnes & Noble and you go right to the books on how to be successful, how to make a lot of money, how to be happy, self-help books. Yep. These YouTube people out there, right? And the whole entire time, the Bible aisle is just dusty. Right. But look at here, you know, if you turn, if you go to any bookstore that sells Bibles, you turn to Second Chronicles chapter 32, 1, oh. 31. Literally just ch -ch -ch, flip the pages. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Look, there it is, Second Chronicles. Now you go to 31, chapter 31, and scroll down to the 21st verse. 21st. It literally tells you how to yeah, have right. a prosperous life. Yeah. Right? Right here. It says, and all that Hezekiah did. In the service of the temple of the God and all of his efforts to follow God's laws and commands, Hezekiah sought his God, Yahweh, Jehovah, 
the King of Kings, wholeheartedly. And as a result, he was very successful. I mean, that's it, John. One, one scripture. Come on now, baby. And guess who was a Gentile who accepted God? Ruth. Ruth. Ruth said, your God is now my God. It's you know like- who also? Did? Rahab. Ray, yes. You, you know who also? Mary Magdalene. Come on, keep them coming. Yeah, keep yeah. Them. There's plenty of them. I, I mean, remember Balaam? Claim it. The prophet? How, I mean, there's so many. There's so many. And Abraham, out of nowhere, he says, yes, God, I will follow you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All you got to do, you, can, you know how much money people could save, John, if they would just buy the Bible and read Second Chronicles 31, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 31, verse 21? Yeah. Anyway, all right, here we go. 32. We're getting close. 36 is where we see we got 36. The king. That's the, that's where we start seeing the king. 35 and 6 where he says, "I found the book." Now, I have to do a gro- a grocery trip with my family. <sighs> what, you want you want to continue later? You want to do it t- later tonight? We're going to finish tonight. Let me, let me be blunt about that. I'm not trying to get out of finishing. I'm just saying we can either keep going or we can spark it up again before bed. I, I mean, I, I, we can let's 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 go for a bit more. All right, let's do this chapter. Right. Thirty-two. Technically, we have forty minutes b- before it's three hours. Yeah, let's go. After King Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work, King Shenacherib uh, of Assyria invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified towns, giving orders for his army to break through their walls. When Hezekiah realized that Shenacherib also intended to attack Jerusalem, he consulted with his officials and military advisors. They decided to stop the flow of the springs outside the city. They organized a huge work crew to stop the flow of the springs, cutting off the brook that ran through the fields. For they said, why should the kings of Assyria come here and find plenty of water? Then Hezekiah worked hard at repairing all the broken sections of the wall, erecting towers and constructing a second wall outside the first. He also reinforced the supporting terraces in the city of David and manufactured large numbers of weapons and shields. He appointed military officers over the people and assembled them before him in the square at the city gate. Then Hezekiah encouraged them by saying, be strong and very courageous. Courageous. Do not be afraid and discouraged because the king of Assyria or his mighty army, for there is a power far greater on our side. Yes. Oh, my man. Right, Nights. Yeah, that, hey, look, that's what they were saying. Like, if God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 8. He may have a great army, but they are merely men. We have the Lord, our God, to help us and to fight our battles for us. Hezekiah's words greatly encourage the people. I love this king, John. Man, look at this guy. I love it, right? So while they king, are, yeah. Men. They are merely men. Look at that. Mm. He may have a great army, but they are merely men. Yeah. Oh, God, this man. He, Hezekiah is going down as one of the greatest kings of all time right now. Oh, while King Shernacherib of Assyria was still besieging the town of Lachish, he sent his officers to Jerusalem with this message for Hezekiah and all the people in the city. Kind of like Xerxes, remember? He's like, with the heads of the kings. Punk. Yes, yes. This is what King Shernacherib of Assyria says. What are you trusting in that makes you think you can survive my siege of Jerusalem? Hezekiah has said, the Lord our God will rescue us from the king of Assyria. Surely Hezekiah is misleading you, sentencing you to death by famine and thirst. That's just like the, the devil and the snake. Exactly. Eve. Does it, oh, God, did it mean that? God yeah. can't do that. Like, yeah, you know, trying to do anything to knock you off the walk with the Lord. You nailed it. Exactly. Oh, yeah, your king is misleading you. Verse 12, don't you realize that Hezekiah is, a, is the very person who destroyed all the Lord's shrines and altars? Which Lord? He's lying here, see? He commanded Judah and Jerusalem to worship only at the altar, at the temple, and to, to offer sacrifices on it alone. Surely yeah. you must realize what I and the other kings of Assyria before me have done to all the people of the earth. Were any of the gods of those nations able to rescue their people from my power? 
which of their god was gods were a, was able to rescue it its people from the destructive power of my predecessors what makes you think your god can rescue you from me don't let hezekiah deceive you don't let him fool you like this i say it again no god of any nation or kingdom has ever yet been able to rescue his people from me or my ancestors how much less will your god rescue you from my power and Shernacharib's officers further mocked the Lord God and his servant, Hezekiah, heaping insults upon insults. The king also sent letters scorning the Lord and the God of Israel. He wrote, Just as the gods of all the other nations failed to rescue their people from my power, so the God of Hezekiah will also fail. The Assyrian officers, uh, officials who brought the letter shouted this in Hebrew to the people gathered on the walls of the city, trying to terrify them so it would be easier to capture see, the city. See, see, notice how all of this is happening after all of the celebrations. Yep. See, when the hot, when the when the water is boiling, and they're celebrating, and everyone's on fire for Yahweh. Yeah. Is when the enemy attacks the most. Here's the snake slithering up deceiving the people, trying to buck them off the uh, horse. It's, just, it's interesting how that happens, right? Yeah. Well, you know, in the New Testament, Jesus says, uh, he tells us uh, a, a parable, and he says, look, the enemy comes to steal the word. When the word is sown, the enemy comes to steal it out of your heart. So when you have all these people loving God and celebrating him and doing the, the, uh, the, the service to the Lord on a continual basis, the enemy comes knocking. Yeah, try to take it away, but guess what? Hezekiah, I feel gonna hand, he's gonna stand strong. Let's see. Uh, uh, nineteen. These officers talked about the God of Jerusalem as though he were one of the pagan gods made by human hands. Then King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, that's prof, That's the major prophet Isaiah, by the way. Cried out in the in prayer to God in heaven. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed the Assyrian army with all its commanders and officers. Hold on. There's not a plural. <laughs> There's not a plural. One Please. angel. Yeah, 21. And the Lord sent an angel. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> not an army of angels. An angel. Yeah, literally. Uh, literally. Who destroyed the Assyrian army with all the commanders and officers. That's why when Jesus comes back on the white horse... And we're behind him, and he's coming to defeat the enemy. It ain't nothing. Look, Second Kings says that a hundred and eighty-five thousand men were killed by one angel in a night. So you think about this: one angel, my God! You, you imagine a thirty-foot, powerful, angelic, anointed being with double swords comes in. Forget it. You're done. I know. I love. I'm glad that you said that. One angel. So weak. I mean, the enemy is so weak. Yeah, yeah totally. One angel wipe out all of these people. Gone. Come on. So Shennacherib was forced to return home in disgrace to his own land. And when he entered the temple of his god, some of his own sons killed him there with a sword. What a disgrace! Horrible. Son. Look, if you start, if you start coming against God with your mouth, look out, buddy. Yeah, when you're speaking blasphemy, right? Yeah. Which God makes that clear that you know that's actually an un that's an unforgivable sin. Blasphemy. Well, that's well, that's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. But yeah, yeah. it's it, it's look out, dude. I mean, when you're saying you know, it's not like oh, I don't believe in God, or I kind of do, but maybe I don't, or I'm an atheist, but there's some wiggle room. No, we're not talking about those people. No, you're cursing yeah. God. Cursing God, worshiping the devil, antichrist, mm -hmm. smoking biscuits, and you see their lives. I know some people that maybe aren't that extreme, but and they're all over Facebook, and you're sitting there going, their life is a mess. And I'm trying right. not to judge, Lord forgive me, but you're just sitting there going, oh my golly gee willikers, every single day. Yeah. It's just nothing but just negativity and hardship and self-inflicted -conflicted pain. I hear you. And you're just like, all you need is God. Like Cain, John, they cursed themselves. We just read a few chapters ago, when you turn your back to God, God turns his face away from you. I oh, know. 
They, interesting enough, right? That makes sense because think about the Israelites. They reached out and, and yelled to God, come back. We love you. We're sorry. Then he turned his face back. Like that image of the turning away. Now, he didn't go anywhere, but he turned his face. So you want God to turn back to you? Turn to God. Amen. <laughs> turn to God. Oh, 22. That is how the Lord rescued Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from King Sharnacherib of Assyria and from all the others who threatened them. So there was peace throughout the land. From then on, King Hezekiah became highly respected among all the surrounding nations and many gifts for the Lord arrived at Jerusalem with valuable pre presents for King Hezekiah too, or also. Look, you, you call on the name of the Lord and he sends his angel. Ha <laughs> ha! 24. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. He prayed to the Lord who healed him and gave him a mirac miraculous sign. But Hezekiah did not respond appropriately to the kindness shown him and he became proud. So the Lord's anger came against him and against Judah and Jerusalem. Look, nobody, John, is is uh, I gonna say it, it is immune to pride. You got to watch out, man. Reminds me of Moses. You remember when God yeah. was basically like, "Who's we?" He's like, "Well, you got a mouse in your pocket." You got, really? Hey, bro, who's we? Exactly. You know, prideful. Moses became. Moses was thinking he was God. He was like. Side by side, you know, connect mm -hmm. with God. It was him, God, and everybody else. Yeah. Hey. God, like, no, Moses, you have it. You have it wrong, my 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 son. But look at the, this great man. Look at this. The God. This this man of God. Twenty six. Then Hezekiah humbled himself and repented of his pride. Repent. As as yeah, he turned away. That word repented doesn't mean to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No no no. It said repent means to turn away from your sin get away from it and do no do that no more remember jesus doesn't he doesn't just say say i'm sorry right he says repent of your sin mm. and then he will confess your sin repent of it and he will cleanse you so he repented of his pride as did the people of jerusalem so the lord's anger did not fall on them during hezekiah's lifetime man i am gonna hug this man with all my might when I get there. Oh. What a man of God. Hezekiah was very wealthy and highly honored. He built special treasury buildings for his silver, gold, and precious stones and spices, and for his shields and other valuable items. He also constructed many storehouses for his grain, new wine, and olive oil. And he made many stalls for his cattle and pens for his flocks and sheep and goats. He built many towns and acquired vast flocks and herds, for God had given him great wealth. He blocked up the upper spring of Gihon and brought the water down through a tunnel to the west side of the city of David. And he and so he succeeded in everything he did. However, when ambassadors arrived from Babylon to ask about the remarkable events that had taken place in the land, God withdrew from Hezekiah in order to test him. I wonder what that says. Uh, yeah. Um, interesting. And, and, and to see what was really in his heart. Yeah, because you give, you know, God's bless, 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 bless. And, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like, you know, you almost think to yourself, like, you know, I, you know, I'm so blessed. It's, I, I'm overwhelmed. I'm, 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 I can't believe how blessed I am as we, as we speak yeah. tonight. And I read the Bible with you. I have so much love. I'm so hot water for God. And I just, there's just so much excitement and everything. And, I pray, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And I, I just live for God. I, I dance for the Lord with all my might, like, you know, King David, 2 Samuel 6, 14. And I always sometimes ask myself, okay, let me ask you a question, John, John North, when I'm brushing my teeth at night. Mm. What happens if hardship hits, like yeah. real hardship? Yeah. And over and over again a few times, you still going to be sparkling up with Brian? You still going to have that same energy? You still going to be dancing for the Lord with all your might like King David? You still gonna be praying and going to church and spreading the word and making King David shirts and David and Goliath shirts and 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 getting Ruth tattoo and creating a Deborah hat and, a, and Jesus is King hat. You still gonna be hot for the Lord when times get tough, John? Mm. I ask myself sometimes that. Now I haven't been there yet, 
Because I haven't had any like hard times in my life ever since I got saved. Like, I mean, of course, I've had hard times, but not like hard, hard times. And it's a question I ask myself that daily. And the answer, I guarantee you, will be yes. Mm. I will right. praise the Lord and dance for, with all my heart, with all my might. But it's a question that we need to be prepared for and ask ourselves and not be naive, naive of. Yeah, it's a well said. I mean, look, the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. destroy. You know, so, you know, and not that God's tricking you or, you know, bringing hardship toward you. I don't think that happens at all. In fact, Job, I don't believe it all talks like that. I don't think it's written that way. I don't think, it, I don't believe it's wrong to think about it that way. God doesn't bring hardship, but when hardship comes, when trials and tribulations come, when people from another country come, God watches. He says, what's in your heart, buddy? What is in your heart? I want to see the true man. Have you learned what I've taught you? And are you going to choose? You know, you remember Abraham. He's sitting there, John, and the Lord tells him, take your boy, your only boy, for, you know, your only righteous boy. Of course, he had, he had the other one, but he was um, not from the righteous line. He said, take your boy Isaac from, you, from Sarah and take him to the mountain. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Bring him up there. Take a knife. And he did it. And he, he took, he went up the mountain. But you know what he had in his heart? He said, and it's revealed in Hebrews chapter four, against hope, he knew that God would raise him from the dead if he had to, because Isaac was the promised son, the lineage, right? That he would bless the world through Isaac. So he knew. So the hardship came. He trusted in God to do the miraculous even if he had to. Of course, he stopped him. We all know he found a ram. He sacrificed it, and he made the covenant. But um, God is good. And so uh, sometimes, man, yeah. you, you might think you're by yourself when hardship happens, and God's saying, what you got in there, buddy? I'm here. Like, he didn't go away. He withdrew himself right. to find out right. what was inside. And he could have inspired him. It reminds me of when God said to uh, Adam, you know, Adam, where are you? Yeah, what are you going to say now, Adam? Yeah, you think God didn't know where Adam was? I mean, this is the creator of as, heaven and earth. As Brett likes to say, he always goes, there's, there's two people on earth. You don't think God knows what these two people are? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you think yeah, exactly. You think he well, you think Adam, you think God just beams down on a random spot and has to search for him? No. He just yeah. happens to walk by in the garden right next to Adam and Eve. Right. Yeah, I love it. All right, 32 the rest of the events in Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion are recorded in the vision of the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, which is included in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So there's another section of, of Isaiah's writings somewhere. 33, when Hezekiah died, he was buried in the upper area of the royal cemetery and all Judah and Jerusalem honored him at his death. And his son... Manasseh became the next king. Now, now let me tell you what. Can we can we go to this burial site? Like, is this a place that we can put on our uh, our ten day trip of sites to see? So I think so. Like, this is a video I sent you, or I can resend it, of people finding this royal cemetery. Yeah. And they think they think they found King David where he was buried. No way. Yes, yes. So this it has like these areas. So uh so I don't know. I think so. Let's 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 think about that because that would be fun, right? We don't have to spend all day there, but Got I think it. you could walk in that area. It's an archaeological dig, but Hey, can I just say something. God does not give us the answer here, by the way, in thirty one. No, he doesn't. He doesn't I mean, obviously I think we can look at the life of Hezekiah and he ran back to God every moment. Yeah, you know, it just goes to show you that I think this is so fascinating. I think this is God. This is my opinion, where God is like, wait, yeah. Uh, go ahead. I think He does give us the answer, John. Look at thirty-two. Let's look at it closer. The rest of the events in Hezekiah's reign and his acts of devotion. Now there it is. Are recorded. So I think right. he's kind of hinting, like, look, we might not have heard the exact tests that were happening. 
you know, when the uh, when Babylon showed up, because remember Babylon was the the uh, evil empire that wa- that eventually took over Israel and captured them all. This is Nebuchadnezzar. So he was, I think, his devotion toward God was was solid. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but you know, God God's not giving us the details, you know. Yep. Which is which is fine. You know, we're lucky we get what we get. You know what I'm saying? He said, you ever see, you know, your 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 parents, you know, back like I used to be like, oh, Dad, I don't want the broccoli. Mom's like, my mom was like, you're luck, you're lucky you have broccoli. <laughs> exactly. You, know, you should be grateful that you have this dinner. I know you want other things and you want more of this and that, but you know what? You got a great plate of food in front of you. Be grateful for that. Like, yeah, we're we're, we're blessed to have what we have. Yeah. Think about that. Like, yeah. God doesn't need to give us all of this. Like, we we get a full Bible to read and study and walk with, which is such a blessing, way more than we deserve. Yeah. And do we want more? Yes. But, you know, that's for the uh, afterlife. Yeah, it's coming. And, you know, all desire. God God is not about lacking uh, of, of stuff or giving you things and enjoyment. It's coming, though. Hang in there. Right? There's a few little years, John. Vapor. This life is a mere mist of vapor. And then uh and then we're in eternity living the good life where there's no death. There's no sin. And if there is sin, you know, think about this. Is there sin, John, in, in the eternity? There could be. Mm-hmm. But we have Jesus, instant forgiveness, instant cleansing. Now, I'm not saying we're going to sin like this. We won't have a bot. We won't have the same body. The pressures won't be there. We probably won't sin. But I'm just saying it's, uh, it's going to be wonderful and um, magnificent. But really thinking about heaven and eternity, because heaven comes down and to merge to the earth, right? It's going to be amazing. Yeah. That's what a lot of people don't really know, that the, the, the city of heaven, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, comes down onto the earth forever. And yeah. we're not in heaven. We're on earth. Yeah. Heaven yeah. is on earth. Anyway. Yeah, that is interesting. But do you think that there's a possibility, though, that after the thousand years that we're going to go somewhere else? Or do you think he's just going to make the world new again? New again. Okay. I do think that we'll travel and explore the the universes, the universes, or who knows. Interesting. Like, I don't think – why I think sin stopped – the development of the universe, right? Because God clearly created Pluto and Uranus and Mm -hmm. Jupiter and Saturn and the constellations and all of that. He did it, right? If you, if you look at the astrological or the astron, all the astronomy, not, not the worship of the stars, which is astrology, but the astrological, all of the, all, all of the constellations tell a story of, of the lion of Judah, Right, it's the it's the creation all the way to the end. It's an amazing story, and God put it there for a reason to point us, not only on Earth but in looking to the heavens to point to Him, and um, it's ama- it's amazing. And so I think He didn't just put it out there for that alone. I think we're going to explore that. I think we're going to use that. We're going to be there. It's going to be amazing. It's John. Think about it. I just you know I don't understand, but it's he is so creative and vast. He is limitless. He is mm. unlimited. So I anything is possible. Any extravagant thought, it's possible. Right. So, yeah. but I think heaven is the base. I think it's heaven on earth. It's the New Jerusalem sitting on Earth, probably on top of Israel. It's fifteen hundred feet wide. Excuse me, fifteen hundred miles wide, fifteen hundred miles across, and fifteen hundred miles high. This is the city of Jerusalem in heaven, the New Jerusalem. Right, it's gonna right. be amazing. Gonna be amazing. So now we're here. Chronicles, Second Chronicles, thirty-three. Here's the question: We have four chapters. Do you want to stop? Go to go to H E B, and then come back later. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. By the way, thirty-four is the recap of my uh, my tattoo after Ruth of when uh, Hezekiah discovers God's law. I told you, yeah, I told you. Hey, I found the book, King. Yeah, I love this. Josiah. Movie. Like, you, you want to read thirty-four, Brad, or do you want to get to Ruth one? Let's. Or I'm sorry, 
Ezra won. To be honest, I don't care. It's up to you. You you had a heart. Your heart was to Ezra. We can we can stop here at thirty three, finish thirty three, and be ready in the morning. That's fine. Things that Ezra, Ezra one is really short, and then Ezra two was all names. Let's, so let's read 33 and then we'll we'll pick it up in the morning with Brett Metter. I, I think you know what I think and I, I don't want to like uh, the whole thing of this is just we read we go through this journey and we don't want to like plan too much right so I don't want to over plan I don't want to set it up too much but I will say I think it'd be really cool to read 34 with Brett just because of the story of finding the Bible and how you know Brett's a Bible you know teacher you know, yeah, well, we all love the word. I know, that's the thing. Let's do it, John. Let's just read 33 and get out of here. Manasseh. How you think? Let's do it, huh? Let's do it. I think 34 is a good uh, a good chapter to read with Pastor Brett. So, so great. We're going to end on a sour note because Manasseh was the most evil who brought Jerusalem back into darkest. Yeah. But that's okay. 33 verse 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the detestable practices of the pagan nations that the Lord had driven from the land ahead of the Israelites. He, re he rebuilt the pagan shrines uh, his father, Hezekiah, had broken down. God. He constructed altars for the images of Baal and set up Asherah poles. He also bowed before all the powers of the heavens and worshipped him. You know, not to not to uh, bring it up, but you know, a lot of times some pastors' sons or ministers' uh, family, because some people are so dedicated to God, they turn. You know, how is that possible? Uh, it just happens. You see it time and time again. The son like changes everything and goes back to the evil. You know, you have one king that's good, his son does bad, his son next son does bad, his third son does the the next son does great, the next son does great, and then the next son goes back into darkness. I don't know. But think about this. The guy was twelve years old when he 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 got power. You know, and so he has it all. He has every yes, sir. What do you want, sir? Now you're you're king, sir. You know, he didn't really did, did a twelve year old learn the ways of the Lord? He should have. You know, yeah. uh, you know. So, anyway, um, for he began, he built pagan altars in the temple of the Lord, the place where the Lord had said, "My name will remain in Jerusalem forever." He built these altars for all the powers of the heavens in both courtyards. There it is again, the powers of the heavens, lowercase, in the both courtyards of the Lord's temple. Manasseh also sacrificed his own sons in the fire in the valley of Ben Hinnomen. He practiced sorcery, divination, and witchcraft, Ooh. and he consulted with mediums and psychics. There he it is. did much. He did, yeah. Ugh. He did much evil. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Manasseh even took a carved idol he he had made and set it up in the God in God's temple, the very place where God had told David and his his son Solomon, "My name will be honored." forever in this temple and in Jerusalem, the city I have chosen from among all the tribes of Israel. If the Israelites will be careful to obey my commands, all the laws, decrees, and regulations given through Moses, I will not send them into exile from this land that I set aside for your ancestors. But Manasseh led the people of Judah and Jerusalem to do even more evil than the pagan nations that the Lord had destroyed when the people of Israel entered the land. Even more evil. And this is what ticks God off so much that they just, he went off, right? Uh, verse 10, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they ignored all his warnings. Notice he spoke to the people also. So the Lord sent the, sent the commanders of the Syrian armies, and they took Manasseh prisoner. They put a ring through his nose, bound him in bronze chains, and led him away to Babylon. But while in deep distress, Manasseh sought the Lord his God and sincerely humbled himself before the God of his ancestors. He got wise, John. 
Mm-hmm. And when he prayed, the Lord listened to him and was moved by his requests. God. So the yeah. Well, you know, God is so merciful. I'm so glad I'm not God. I would have whooped this kid. But cut this guy. <laughs> Get that sword out. I would have just I would have thrown this guy in the lake of fire. I'm telling you, God, it angers me to think this kid grew up worshiping and doing oh just selfish. You know, he doesn't know better. That's no excuse. But okay, so the Lord brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then oh, guess warm as my heart. Then finally, then Manasseh finally realized that the Lord alone is God. After this, Manasseh rebuilt the outer wall of the city of David. John, this means that, okay, I'm going to keep going. From the west of the Gihon Spring in the Kidron Valley to the Fish Gate and continued around the hill of Ophel. By the way, Gihon is one of the, the rivers from the Garden of Eden. Oh. Yeah. He built the wall very high and he stationed his military officers in all of the fortified towns of Judah. I'm kind of getting excited because Brett's coming tomorrow. Yeah. Manasseh also removed the foreign gods and the idol from the Lord's temple. He tore down all the altars he had built on the hill where the temple stood and all the altars that were in Jerusalem. And he dumped them outside the city. Glory to God. This kid, good job. Mm. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings and thanksgiving off- offerings on it. He also encouraged the people of Judah to worship the Lord, the God of Israel. However, the people still sacrifice at the pagan shrines, though only to the Lord, uh, to the Lord their God. How, wait, however, the people still sacrifice at the pagan shrines, though only to the Lord their God. Okay, so they actually were uh, sacrificed to the Lord, but on the pagan shrines. Interesting. Mm. The rest of the events of Manasseh's reign, his prayer to God, and the words of the of the seer who spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel are recorded in the book of the kings of Israel. Manasseh's prayer, the account of the way God answered him, and an account of all his sins and unfaithfulness are recorded in the record of the seers. It includes a list of the locations where he built pagan shrines and set up Asherah poles and idols before he humbled himself and repented. When Manasseh died, he was buried in the palace. Then his son Amon became the next king. Manasseh's in heaven. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Manasseh's in heaven. And you would never think that reading the first half of this chapter. I know, right? I, we wanted to burn him at the stake. Yeah, you know, but God's mercy and, and the free will are also, not only God's mercy, but the free will of Manasseh, who repented and turned away, went back to God. You know, that's that's the power of the Lord. The Lord saves. Like, he saves souls for eternal life. How amazing is that? And Jesus continues to do that, you know, when he, when he came and, and, and rose from the dead. And, you know, it's amazing. It truly is. This is like the, st- look, the story, John, of Jesus happens over and over in these chapters. You fall away, he restores you when you call on the name of the Lord. You fall away, he restores you when you call on the name of Jesus. You fall away, and he restores you when you get back before his face. It's amazing. Come on, Brian Edge. And you know what's interesting, too, is in the Old Testament, you never hear the word saved. People don't use the word saved. Like, oh, yeah, King David was saved. You never hear that term. And it's true. It's a term that actually should be used. Like, I, you know— it's interesting, like Manasseh, like you could say, like he got saved, like absolutely, it's like he got saved. Ruth, Ruth, perfect example, one sixteen, right? It's going on my arm here. Any next time I'm at the tat store, she that was the that's the verse where she got saved. Yeah, but you really only hear that word, that term, in like as Christians, like in the New Testament. But King David got saved. Ruth got saved. Uh, any Gentile, any Jew back then before pre-Jesus, that accepted Yahweh, that loved Yahweh, saved their soul for eternal life. Amen. Amen. You, look, I'll prove it right here. Verse 13, the last part. Then Manasseh finally realized that the Lord alone is God. And, you know, he had a change of heart right there. So that's it, man. When people like Ruth, just like you're talking about, people, people like uh, Rahab, you know, 
all these people, when you turn to, just like you said, when you turn to God, like David, he was saved after he repented and turned his face back toward God. Manasseh, did he did worse things, John, than all the foreigners living in the land, all the pagans, all those who sacrificed their, their sons and daughters, who had horrible sexual morality, just all kinds of terrible sins over and over again. Mm-hmm. Manasseh did worse than that, yet God still brought him back. He murdered John. He did everything evil, and God still said, yes, you're good, buddy. Come on back in. Yeah, I amen to that. And shout out to, by the way, Sherry. Sherry's still with us. She's been on here. This is a two-hour and 42-minute podcast. Uh, I want to make the announcement right here and now. This is the longest podcast in the history of weightlifting talk. Yeah, right? baby. 2012. That's good. I'm loving it. Look, I feel like the more I'm into it, the more I want to go, you know? (laughs) Yeah, look at this. And then we're not done yet. Yeah, slam dunk the whole thing. On rules and Judy. Here we go. Verse 21, then we're done. And then Brett calls in tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central Time, uh, reading with Pastor Brett Metter of Athey Creek. Very exciting. Here we go. Verse 21. Amon was 22 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem two years. Uh, this is this is the son of Manasseh. Uh, that was me saying that. Verse 22. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father Manasseh had done. He worshipped and sacrificed uh, to all the idols his father had made. But unlike his father, he did not humble himself before the Lord. Instead, Amon sinned even more. Mm. Look at that. 24. The Amon's own officials conspired against him and assassinated him in his palace. But the people of the land killed um, all those who had conspired against King Amon, and they made his son Josiah the next king. Josiah. Yeah. Josiah. Josiah. Young king, too. It's like it's seven or eight. Or... Josiah, who's on the Team Attitude Nation now. Yeah, very cool. Um, Remember look at this that... here. Look, unlike his father, mm-hmm. he, did not, he did not get saved. You know, um, because... You know, you got to understand, too, is like just because you were Jewish at this time, right, just because you were an Israelite does not mean that you automatically go to Abraham's bosom. That is not what that means. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You have to get saved even as a Jew. You have to love Yahweh. Amen. You have to accept Yahweh like we must accept Jesus post-Jesus. That's it. Yeah. And just because you're Jewish does not mean like I'm I'm going. Yeah, just because yeah, just because you think you're doing the acts of service doesn't mean that your heart is right. Right. Yeah. What is? It's, of, yeah. Like, you know, people at this time period right now that live in like Alaska, there's probably a lot going on in Alaska. We just don't get it in the Bible, right? God is just he's not writing about that. Right. 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 There's a lot that's not being written. We know that. We actually just talked about that last chapter with the end of Manasseh's story. There's there's Gentile in Alaska that have accepted God, that have been saved. Mm. Absolutely. I, that's why I think people um, who died in the flood, John, there were more than just eight who knew God. And even though they didn't he, heed the warning, that's why I think some, more, I think some of them survived. Uh, it didn't survive, but they made it to heaven. Yeah. But if not, you know, it is what it is. Look, he, he even he didn't right there. Twenty three, unlike his father, he did not humble himself. He didn't get saved. He didn't make the Lord God his Lord forever. Yeah. Twenty four years old, the man died. Really sad. No, he doesn't say he got buried either. Just whack, he's over. Yeah. No, man. Look at and that. And then they crowned the eight year old Josiah. Mm-hmm. Josiah. Because guess what? He he commissions Hezekiah. He's like, go find that book. Right, go in the temple and search, and then, uh, not to give anybody a spoiler, but we've already read it. He goes, "I found it, King. I found it." It's gonna be exciting. Hezekiah, I thought Hezekiah was the king that died. Hezekiah, no, Helkiah, the priest. Oh God, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this, and also, here's what's so cool about how Brett's calling in tomorrow, and you know this, Brian. I just talked about this the other day. Is that I, I said live on air. I want to get. To, I want to know that the story coming up in 34. I want to know it better because I'm about to get it inked. Oh, you're about to know it. And it's one of my favorite stories. And I just, I feel like I just don't know it as well as I should. Like, I don't know it as well as I know, like, 
crossing the Jordan. Well, you know, you could do David and Goliath. You could read it to the kids tonight. Go back to Second Kings. Can't. Okay, maybe I go to Second. Yeah, you go back to the real story. We already read it. Yeah, Second Kings. You're right. You're right. No, it's going to be great. I think it's a perfect chapter for Brett to call in on. Uh, yeah, I think we're perfect. God, what a good good a study tonight. Three hours. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, and shout out to Sherry, and shout out to James McDermott, and uh, to Dale Moody, and anybody listening on the recorded version a few days from now that just listen to the entire show, maybe on a road trip, maybe at work, <laughs> you got the headphones in, maybe working out on the treadmill, whatever it was. Thank you, guys. That was a great study. Absolutely. God is good. Should I pray it out? Yeah, let's do it. Father, we love you. Thank you for always taking us back, even when we mess up. You always, you know, it's like every time we, if we fall on our face, you say in First Chronicles, right? If we turn from our wicked ways, you will hear from heaven and you will heal our land. And we love you so much for that, Lord. And we look forward to tomorrow's study with with uh, another brother in the Lord. Um, it's going to be exciting, and we love you so much. Thank you for revelation and continuing to strengthen our relationship between us and yourself uh, and between John and I and all of our friends listening and, and on this journey with us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the message of restoration. Even though we fall, you will be there to pick us up every single time. In the name of Jesus, we come to you. Amen. 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 Well, thank you guys so much for listening. We'll see you guys back tomorrow morning, 11 a.m. Central Time, uh, with special guest pa uh, Pastor Brett Metter of Athey Creek. Have a great night, everybody. Salute.